Well, good morning. My name is Scott McDermott. I think my microphone's on. Yeah, hey, good morning. Um, welcome to Six Points Church. We are glad that you are here. I know it's a cold day, uh, but it hasn't snowed yet. Uh, I hear crazy things. I'm, I'm worried about the snow this week, uh, but nonetheless, I am glad that you are here. Before I get into the sermon about Kingdom Come today, I want to say thank you to a couple people. Um, I think it's important to recognize when people go above and beyond. So David Hardesty was not supposed to be leading worship today, uh, but Andrew Kola, our assistant pastor, youth pastor, um, is sick with COVID, and so uh, David stepped up, and I appreciate that very much. And Yes? He and Caitlin, by the way, are fine. They're just, you know, they're, they're at home, uh, as they should be. Um, and I also want to take a minute just to recognize our leadership team here at Six Points Church. Uh, many of you know, and we're praying for the leadership retreat that we had this weekend, which I appreciate very much. Um, we were able to spend quite a bit of time together with about a dozen leaders from our church who represent both the leadership board, but also the, the ministry leadership team that oversees the various ministries of the church. And it was just such a wonderful time, and I was so glad that they were willing to take that time, set it aside, um, to be a part of that. And we just had so much fun. We had energy. We had excitement about what God is doing and is going to do at our church. So I want to thank them publicly for making the time for that. So if you could give them a round of applause, they deserve it. I think people have no idea how much time and effort and energy they put into uh, making this church go. And it's, it's truly a blessing to me. Well, hey, we are in a series called Kingdom Come, which is really a part of a larger theme for the year that we're calling the Red Letter Year. And the reason we're calling it that is we are studying the teachings of Jesus, and the words of Jesus in many Bibles are in red ink, right? And even on my Bible app, they are in red, it's not ink, I don't know what to call it, red font, yes, okay, uh, they're in red. And so if you read through your Bible, it may or may not have the words of Jesus in red, but many do, and we're just going to focus on those words, okay, the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus for this entire year. And so we're starting by looking at some of Jesus' parables in Matthew 13, which are all about the kingdom of God. And so that's where we're at. And so last week, this week, and for two more weeks, we're going to be looking at these particular parables that talk about the kingdom of God. Jesus uses that phrase a lot. He interchangeably uses the phrase kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Some people think they mean slightly different things. For our purpose, we're going to use them in the same way. Okay, so this idea of the kingdom of God. And last week, we tried at least to begin unpacking what is the kingdom of God. And Jesus tries to teach us what the kingdom of God is. It's one of his main teachings throughout the Gospels is what is the kingdom of God, and he uses lots of parables to do that. He says the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is like this. He uses all these little word pictures, all these little ways of trying to explain to us a, a very difficult and complex spiritual reality in a way that we could understand. So last week we started with this from Matthew 13, 44. It's a short parable. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. It's a simple story, right? A man finds treasure. He realizes the value of the field has now grown exponentially because it has treasure in it. So he goes and buys the field knowing the true value of the field is because of that treasure, right? The treasure is valuable. And so we told you two things. First, in that parable, the kingdom is the treasure. That is the thing that has value, the kingdom of God. And that the treasure, which is the kingdom, is worth the sacrifice. Whatever sacrifice you have to make. For the man in the story, it's selling everything he owns, for us, it's going to be a different kind of sacrifice. And Jesus was not shy about explaining that following him, being a part of the kingdom, was going to require sacrifice. He told his disciples they needed to pick up their cross and follow him. How often did they need to do that? Every day. This was not going to be easy. This was going to be hard. This was going to be difficult. It was going to be dangerous. It might cause relational conflict. 
It might cause you to change your career focus. It might cause you to do things you would not otherwise want to do. He encourages his followers. If someone hits them, let them hit you again. Don't fight back, right? And we all hate that teaching of Jesus, but I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. You can ignore it if you want to, but you're just ignoring the teachings of Jesus, right? That when someone forces us to go a mile, we should offer to go another. These are the teachings of Jesus. And so he says, it's worth the sacrifice. Whatever, whatever sacrifice is required, it's worth it to be a part of the kingdom. I'm not sure that we fully embrace or understand even what Jesus is talking about. It seems to me that many Christians are not willing to make even small sacrifices to get out of their comfort zone at all to follow Jesus these days. The only thing we're willing to do is, is go to church. And, and actually, less and less Christians go to church every year, right? We're not willing to inconvenience our lives in any way, shape, or form to follow Jesus. We think we could just have our lives plus Jesus. And the reality is that's just not what Jesus said. He said it's going to require sacrifice, but it's worth the sacrifice. So this really gets back to the question that I asked last week, and I'll continue to try to explain, is what is the kingdom? Because Jesus says the treasure is the kingdom, and the kingdom is worth the sacrifice. So then the question is, what is the kingdom? And it's hard to explain, guys, because it's not a tangible kingdom. It's an idea. It's a concept. It's a spiritual reality that is very hard for us to grasp. Last week, I told you what the kingdom of God was not, that it doesn't have borders, that it doesn't have uh, walls to keep other people out, that it's not defined by our racial ethnicity or our language, right? The kingdom of God is bigger than those kinds of things. And Jesus even says in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. People kept uh, mocking him even, saying, oh, you're a king. Where is your kingdom, right? Here's a crown of thorns for the king where is your kingdom he says my kingdom is not of this world i don't have the kind of kingdom that you are thinking of i don't have a throne i don't rule with power i don't force people to do things that's not the kind of kingdom that i have so what is the kingdom of god and what is the kingdom of god like well dallas willard one of my favorite authors he says this the kingdom of God is where what God wants done is done. The kingdom of God is where what God wants done is done. I remember reading a book by Elizabeth Elliot, who's a, a famous missionary, and, and the story of the Elliots is just incredible. And one time in her book, she talked about praying for God's will to be done, which I knew that language. That's in the Lord's Prayer. I'm familiar with that. And then she said something that was startlingly honest. She said, I know I don't always want God's will in my life, but I want to want God's will in my life. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being attacked by a bug. Okay. I think that might be the enemy attacking me. Uh, I want to want God's will in my life. Right? Do we always desire what God desires? No. We're human. We're flawed. We're broken. We're bent. We're sinful. We're selfish. But we can want to want God's will in our life. We can desire to want those things. We can pray and ask God, help me be more like you. Help me want the things you want and hate the things you hate. Right? And that will make us part of God's kingdom. Will we be a perfect part of God's kingdom? Probably not. But we're going to be a part of God's kingdom because we desire to do what he desires to be done. Or Diane Langbird said this. I thought this was really, really beautiful. She talks about the human ideas of kingdom, building focus on nation, race, tribe, military strength, and wealth. But Jesus teaches that greatness in his kingdom is found in the character that reflects his likeness. It's not about power in any human sense of the word. It's about doing what God wants and being like who God is. That is what it means to be a part of the kingdom. So today we're going to study another one of these parables from Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about the kingdom. And you're going to read this parable and you're going to think to yourself, 
Pastor Scott, you messed up and read the same parable twice. And I'm telling you, it is very similar, but it is slightly different. So let's read from Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Right? Very similar to the parable that we just heard about the treasure in the field. This parable is often referred to as the pearl of great price, the pearl of great value, right? And, and, and you're right. The stories are very similar. There's something of great value. The person recognizes the value of that thing, and they are willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to make sure they have it, okay? Very similar, but some minor, I think, important differences. So the story of the treasure in the field, which we've already read this morning, we focused on last week, the treasure is found by accident. It, it, it's clear from reading the text, I think, that the man isn't looking for the treasure. He's either walking through the field or he's working in the field, but he's not looking for treasure. He's not out there with a metal detector looking for treasure. He just happens upon the treasure, and once he finds it, then he realizes the value and goes and sells everything he has so he can buy the field. But the merchant is looking for the pearl. He is scouring the earth for not just any pearl. He's looking for the best pearl the most beautiful pearl, the one that is going to just put them all to shame. And when he finally finds it, then he sells everything so that he can buy it. So in one story, the treasure is found by accident. In the other story, the treasure is found on purpose. That is a significant difference in these two stories. I was thinking about people I know who passionately follow Jesus. And there's a lot of them. One of my best friends, his name is Kevin. Kevin is the son of a pastor. Uh, his father is a wonderful free Methodist minister. And Kevin was raised in a home where they went to church every Sunday, right? I know we have some other PKs in the room. Uh, you understand, right? You're at church all the time. You don't have a choice. You just go to church. Kevin was like that. He was raised in the church. He doesn't remember ever not believing in Jesus. From, from the youngest age that he can remember, he knew about and believed in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, at a certain point, he got baptized, and at a certain point, you know, he, he kind of felt a call to ministry, but he never remembers a conversion experience. It didn't happen for Kevin, because there was never a point where he didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. That's just what he was taught from his earliest days. Kevin wasn't looking to follow Jesus, and yet he knows Jesus. Kevin wasn't seeking truth, and yet he knows the truth. Do you understand? There was no intentionality on his part to find the truth of God or find the true Messiah, and yet he follows and believes in the true Messiah. I have other friends, though, that have a very different story. They were not raised in church. Didn't know about God. Didn't know about the Bible. In fact, I'm uh, friends with a young man who was raised in a Mormon household, which is a very different religion than the one that we believe in. And it was because of a friend who invited him to an event that he attended a Christian church and heard about Jesus for the first time in a new way. And he had so many questions, and he was so curious. And I was able to help point him to some truth in Scripture that he didn't know, give him some resources to understand how Christianity was different than how he was raised, and he was hungry to know the truth. He spent so much time asking me questions and wanting to know more about Christianity. And he eventually converted to Christianity and is following Jesus, he sought the truth. He wanted to know. He was hungry to learn. And he found Jesus. But at the end of the day, he is not that much different than my friend Kevin. They are both following Jesus. They are both part of the kingdom of God. One found it by accident. One found it on purpose. Those are two very different stories, but they ended up in the same place. Following Jesus, 
part of the kingdom. That's the truth of these two stories. Some people find the kingdom on purpose. Some people find it by accident. The point isn't how you found the kingdom. The point is that you find the kingdom. So I don't know your story. I don't know how you came to faith. I don't know if you were raised in the church. I don't know if you came to faith later. I don't know if you were introduced to it by a friend. I don't know your story. But the truth is it doesn't really matter. We just have to get people to a point where they recognize the lordship of Christ and they are part of the kingdom of God, right? Now, my friend Kevin, who I mentioned, I have to quote him today. I don't quote him very often because he says some weird stuff, but he does have this little saying that I love to quote. He says, a kingdom without a king is just dumb. Are you with me here? A kingdom without a king is just dumb. If you want to be part of the kingdom of God, great. It means following the king. And the king is Jesus. And if you follow him, then you're part of the kingdom. That's the whole point. Now, I want to backtrack for a second, and I want to stop and evaluate these two parables. We've, we've read both. They're very short. Even together, they're still very short. Jesus tells them back to back. He's repeating himself. I think that's on purpose. And I also think when Jesus repeats himself, we should pay attention because that probably means it's important. But there are two ways to understand both of these parables collectively. Last week, I gave you one interpretation. Okay? I told you that, view number one, the man, uh, that we are the man and the kingdom is the treasure or the pearl. That's kind of interpretation number one. It's an easy interpretation to make, right? We are the men. We are the people who are seeking the kingdom. And the kingdom is the treasure. And that's how I left the sermon. I told you that that was what the sermon means, what the parable means. Some of you probably disliked it because you might hold to interpretation number two, which is this. Jesus is the man, and we are the treasure. So in interpretation number one, we are the people who are seeking the kingdom. Maybe we find it by accident, maybe we find it on purpose, but either way, we are the people, and the kingdom is the treasure. But in interpretation number two, we've got to throw that out the window, and we have to rethink the story from a new perspective. That Jesus is the man. He's the man that finds the treasure. He's the man that seeks the pearl. And that we are the treasure. And if you think of it from that perspective, it changes the whole parable, right? And yet, which one is true? And the answer is, I don't know. I've read from authors who I respect who believe both interpretations. And here's the thing. I believe fully in the truth, the authority of Scripture. 100% without question. I do not believe 100% without question my interpretation of the scripture. My interpretation can be wrong, has been wrong, has changed over the years. There are things I thought I understood that I now have reconsidered. Maybe I was right the first time. I don't know. I know that I'm a flawed human being who doesn't always understand everything. So is it possible that interpretation one is right or interpretation two is right? Yes, they are both possible. And I think both have validity. There can be a deeper truth than the truth that we first understand. And it is absolutely true that the kingdom is valuable. If you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, that will be the greatest thing you ever do. To follow Jesus, to seek his will, to live the way he desires you to live, to give you purpose and meaning for your life beyond your years Absolutely and without question, being a part of the kingdom of God is valuable. But also, humanity is valuable. People are valuable. We're made in the image of God, each and every person, sinner or saint, it doesn't matter. Young or old, it doesn't matter. White or black, it doesn't matter. People are valuable. And we know that this is true. We know that this is true because of one of the easiest verses to remember, right? John 3.16, and I'm, I'm using this verse. I could have used a lot of others because it happens to be the verse that the kids in Kids Quest are memorizing this year, right? And I thought, hey, what a cool idea that we talk about the verse that our kids are talking about right now. It also happens to be a teaching of Jesus, so it ties into my red letter year, right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. How valuable are people? They are valuable enough that Jesus died for them. How valuable are you? 
you are valuable enough that Jesus died for you? How much do you matter enough that God would send his only son so that you might be saved? I don't know which interpretation is right. Maybe they both are. But I know that the kingdom matters. And I know that people matter. And I think both of those things need to be in our minds and in our hearts. That we need to be willing to love and to sacrifice all people. Even the ones you don't like. Maybe especially the ones you don't like. Because Jesus died for them too. Church, I want to pray God's blessing as we leave this place, as we often do. But I want to pray God's blessing on us as a church. We spent the last two days as a leadership team talking about how we can fulfill our mission. One of the things we tried to clarify was what is our mission? Well, it's really easy and also a little complicated. The mission is go and make disciples. It says it really big on the wall out there. It's what Jesus told us right before he ascended up to heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations, right? That's the mission. Now, we have to clarify what is a disciple, because I think that's a churchy word that a lot of people don't understand. It just means to help people become followers of Jesus, right? That's the job. That's what we've been tasked to do. It's easy to say, but to do it is going to take all of us working together, loving people, serving people, helping people, caring for people, listening to people, praying for people, sharing the truth with people. And if we all do it together, then, then, then I am convinced that God is going to do a mighty thing in this place. Pandemic or not, that God can reach people with, the, with his love and his mercy and his truth. So I want to pray that over us as we leave this place. We're also going to be taking communion. I hope you got the little cup uh, as you came in. If you didn't, you can raise your hand and one of these wonderful guys back there will bring one to you. We've got a few here on the right side. Randy, that's your side, buddy. Yep, right up here in the front. Thank you. So we're going to take communion, which is just a beautiful reminder. It's just a beautiful reminder of what we learn in John 3.16. How much did God love humanity? Enough that he sent his son. And his son was willing to be broken, to be beaten, to be mocked, to be spit on. The king of heaven was forced to wear a crown of thorns, but it didn't change who he was. In fact, in that moment, when the people tore his clothes and laughed at him, he was more divine than he'd ever been before. His sacrifice on the cross shows us his true power and his true love. So I'd ask you to peel back that first layer of plastic and remove the wafer. And remember that this reminds us that the body of Christ was broken for you, for your sins, for your neighbor, for their sins, for your parents your siblings, your family, your spouse, all of us, Christ was willing to die and to bleed for. His body was broken. Let us thank God. Amen. And then peel back that second layer and remember that Jesus' blood was shed for you, shed for us, shed for all for the forgiveness of sins. No strings attached. No if you're good enough or no enough or smart enough. But for all. For all who come to the cross. For all who are a part of the kingdom. His blood was shed. Amen. Father, we pray your blessing over us. We are your church. We are your people. You are our God. And we ask that you would use us in this place, in this time, to show your love and your mercy, to speak your truth and share the good news that Jesus is the King, that we are the kingdom, and that God, you have a plan and a purpose for us.
Help us to invite others into that kingdom so that you might be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.